Praise the Lord. How's your spirit? <laughs> Let me ask you again. How's your spirit? <laughs> well, I tell you what, we have been feeding our spirit this weekend. And um, I hope you all are seeing something. Are you seeing something this weekend? What are we seeing a vision of? Let's read the title of the, um, of the conference. The Vision and Experience of the Riches of Christ for the Church. So, you know, I just wanted to say that we cannot overestimate the impact of the vision of the riches of Christ on our lives. He is so rich. He is so full. And he can meet all of our needs. You know, personally, I'm greatly indebted to the Lord and to the faithful brothers that helped me to uh, un remove the veils from me when I was in college. Um, I'm forever thankful to them um, to see this as a young student. I can testify that this has affected everything. It affected what I majored in. It affected how, I, how well I did in school. It affected my um, career, my money, my marriage, who I married, uh, how we raised our kids, uh, etc. So I'll give you a little example. You know, when I found out that um, I, I needed to enjoy the riches of Christ, first of all, that Christ is so unsearchably rich, and I have to gain him in order to be transformed. You know, I used to ride a motorcycle when I was in college, and I was pretty much of a, like a daredevil. I liked that adrenaline rush, you know, when you take the really tight corners, and um, I started seeing the unsearchable riches of Christ that Christ is so much, and that even more, he's the consummated spirit so that I could enjoy him anytime I want. I can enjoy him in my dorm room. I can enjoy him on the way to class. I can enjoy him with some brothers at lunchtime. Oh, man, that changed my life. But you know what started happening when I um, was riding that motorcycle, especially on I-35? <laughs> I was going down I-35, and I started to see myself wrecking and I realized what a loss that would be if I would not gain Christ. You know what happened? I started, I started losing my heart for that motorcycle, and I sold it. You know why I sold it? Because I want Christ. I don't want to wreck and, lo and lose my opportunity to gain Christ. Change me. The vision of the riches of Christ changed me in that, in that way. You know, another thing with my wife, uh, she's, she's back there in the back over there, Betty, um, you know, I didn't want, after I saw the vision of the riches of Christ and even what we're going to see tonight, the produce of the riches of Christ, I didn't want to just marry any old girl out there. I wanted someone that had the same view. Otherwise, I'm going to be going this way, and they're going to be going that way. I'm going to be going for Bethel, which is the house of God, and she might be going after AI, which is the world, right? What's that going to do to our marriage? So I realized I need, I need a sister. First of all, I need a sister. Can you all say amen? <laughs> Brothers, amen. And I wanted not only just a sister, but I wanted a sister who saw the vision that we're seeing this weekend. So it changed my life. And, I, and we were talking today with another couple how, how much, we've been married 33 years now, and how much just having the same vision has made our marriage so much easier. Just so much easier. Anyway, that's just a, that's just a couple things. Uh, so, you know, if you see these matters of the riches of Christ and that all of his riches now, we saw, you know, his divinity, his humanity, you know, all the things that James mentioned in the first message, and then all these riches here, and they were compounded into the all-inclusive, life-giving spirit and have now entered into us. You see us here? <laughs> that's us. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready to go home. I'm satisfied. Aren't you satisfied? The unsearchable riches of Christ are available to you, and you know how to get, get them because he's, in, he's the Spirit, and he's living in your spirit? Isn't that good enough? <laughs> well, it's good enough for us. <laughs> We're ready to go home, but it's not good enough for somebody else. There's somebody else that wouldn't be satisfied if we went home. Because there's somebody that expects something from the dispensing of these unsearchable riches of Christ into us. And you know who that is? God. So tonight, we come to holy ground. You've got to take off your shoes. Just kidding. Uh, because we want to touch God's heart's desire. Uh, what he's after. What he wants. Okay, so we have been, you know, I know in like the Gospel of John, 
The Lord comes as life. He meets every man's case, case after case, the moral, the immoral, the, the sick, the dying, the impotent, the hungry, the thirsty. And where are all those cases? Bondage to sin, you know, uh, blind in religion, even dead. But you know what happens? The Gospel of John doesn't end there. Right after all that, and a little fellowship on foot washing, he says, in my Father's house are many abodes. <laughs> so he brings us to the Father's house, and that's what we come to tonight. So let's read the title of this message. You ready? The Produce of the Riches of Christ, the Church. Okay, again, how about the sisters read it? The brothers. Yeah, and I looked up the word um, produce, and it means things that have been produced or grown, especially by farming. <laughs> so the produce, when, when God gets his riches, his, the unsearchable riches of Christ into someone, there's produce. And what's this produce? It's the church. So like Neil, you know, we have a little bit of a battle to face tonight, and that battle is related to the fact that many of us have, we have a lot of different views of what the church is. So just to help you, maybe, um, if you have a pen and pencil, you know, you got your paper there, just write, the church is blank. Okay? Now, you, you're going to fill in the blank. So go ahead and try to fill in the blank. Whatever you think the church is, put it in there. And we'll just make this a brief exercise. Okay. Are you almost done? Some of, some of y'all might have to write an essay, depending on which student you are. <clears throat> okay, good. So some people, you know, if you look up into dictionary.com, it says there that uh, the d dictionary defines the church as the church is a building used for public Christian worship. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. That's what the dictionary says. Okay, or or a particular Christian organization. For example, you might have the Baptist Church or the Methodist Church or the Presbyterian. So it's an organization, in other words. Well, tonight, we want to see the Bible's view of what the church is. Okay, let's forget about the dictionary.com uh, because there's a battle over this matter of the church. If the Lord gets the church, age is over, enemy goes into the trash can, and, and, and we're done. We live happily forever after together with the triune God in the New Jerusalem. So the enemy, does he, he's trying to veil this. He doesn't want us to see this. So tonight, we really need to empty out our spirit. Lord, show me the church. Let's say that together. Lord, show me the church. Okay, so the first thing we're going to see tonight is the conception and delivery of the church. Uh, that's point one. And how about we have the um, sisters read John 20, 22. Okay, and then the brothers, um, let's, let's read Acts 2, 1 through 2, 4a, and uh, yeah, just through 4a. You ready? Go. So the church is of the Holy Spirit, okay? And I'm, I'm going to refer back to the wiring diagram that James, James showed us on Friday night. You know, here we have uh, God who, as James mentioned, is triune. He's our triune God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He was I incarnated uh, as a man. This is Jesus. He lived a HL, human life, a wonderful human life, expressing all the bountiful virtues of God and his aromatic, I got it backwards, anyway, uh, uh, human virtues. And then he died an all-inclusive death on the cross, terminated everything negative between us and God, between us and one another. And then he was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead and became a what? LGS. What's that stand for? The last Adam became a? Yes, and... Um, 
And he, of course, ascended and was enthroned, A&E there, and then he descended, and right here we just read the verse, he breathed. The first step of this was he breathed into them, and that was on the night of his resurrection. He came to his disciples, and here's his disciples right here. I didn't get 12 of them in there, but he breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit. This was the conception of the church right here. So now this group of people, you could say, is the church. But why are they the church? What makes them the church? <laughs> the Holy Spirit. <laughs> no Holy Spirit, no church. Ten minutes ago, before Jesus showed up in the room, they were not the church. Now he came in and <sighs> breathed into them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now there's the church. The church has been conceived. And 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, you know, the second group of verses, the Spirit was poured out. So first of all, they got the Spirit in them, and then the Spirit was poured upon them. And so now they've got the Spirit within, and they've got the Spirit upon them. So they're in the Spirit, and the Spirit's in them. They are the church. So you have to see this. I mean, I hope, you know, I need my own eyes open to see this. The church is not an organization. The church is not even just a group of people. The church is people who have received the holy spirit and who have the holy spirit upon them this is the church y'all see that so the church is the issue of the triune god passing through the process in christ and dispensing himself into man so these disciples on that night began to enjoy christ the riches of christ they enjoyed christ as another comforter they're enjoying christ as all those things we saw on friday night and what does that make them the church that's the church this is what god is after right here and we're going to get into it tonight in fact let's um let's uh go ahead and go to point two here and we'll just read i want you all to read two three four five six you ready we'll read it all together two three four five and six Yes, yeah, so this, this is the church. The church is the triune God mingled with man to be his dwelling place, to be the body of Christ, to be the fullness of the one who fills all in all, to be the new man, and to be uh, the bride of Christ. That's what the church is. Did anybody write that? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So um, anyway, after, I hope after tonight we could see this, um, something concerning the church. Okay, so... And again, who is this for? Who's the church for? You know, we really get to enjoy the church. The church is such a treasure. The church has meant so much to me and does so much. I mean, I'm so blessed to be in the church. But who ultimately gets the benefit of the, or the produce of what the church is? Who gets it? Yes, God. So tonight we're talking about God's heart's desire. God wants the church. God wants a home. He wants a dwelling place. God wants a body for Christ. God wants uh, the fullness. Anyway, so I hope we see this tonight. That's, that's the goal of this sharing, is if y'all could see this, praise the Lord. Okay, so let's get to the house of God. And there's two points under the house of God. The first one is a little, we'll just have the sisters read it. Ready, sisters, go. And could you please read the next verse? Yeah, so we are being built. Paul says in Ephesians, we're being built together into a dwelling place of God in spirit. So isn't that something? Um, a dwelling place of God, a house for God. And this, you know, if, if, um, if this wasn't in the Bible, I don't think any of us would have imagined that God needs a house. But it, it is in the Bible. And it's, re it's really like even there's a seed sown in Genesis uh, 28, which James alluded to on Friday night with Jacob and his dream. And I tell you, the heavenly ladder that he saw, you know, in Jesus, one, in John 151, he says, you know, he was talking to Nathaniel, and Nathaniel was all impressed that the Lord had said, I saw you under the fig tree. And the Lord said, I don't know what Nathaniel was doing under that fig tree. But the Lord said, you're going to see greater things than these. You're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. 
So Jacob had seen a ladder set up and angels ascending and descending on the ladder. And he says, this, this place is the house of God where there's this connection to, between earth and heaven, connecting. And Jehovah was there. And he was, uh, anyway, it was quite a dream. And you know what? He was right about y'all's age. He was on his way to get married. You know that? He was going to get married. And the Lord gave him this dream. So may, may the Lord give us this dream when we're at this age in our, in our stage in our lives. Okay, let me tell you. Jesus is on the earth, and he says, I am the heavenly ladder. You're going to see angels of God ascending and descending on me, the Son of Man. <laughs> what does this mean? I'm the reality of Jacob's ladder. I'm, I'm the connection between heaven and earth. I join earth to heaven. Do you see the connection? There's a connection right here. Actually, it's just a big ladder. This is the ladder right here. Here's the ladder. <laughs> you know, that whole process is his ladder. And that is Christ joining earth to heaven and bringing heaven to the earth. And where that is, there is the house of God. Do you know where that is? That's right in our spirit. We're, it's right in the church. The church is the house of God. So anyway, that was Jacob's dream. That was like a little seed in Genesis. And then you go on to Exodus. Now, Exodus is a great picture because at the beginning of Exodus, if you all have read your Old Testament, you know, all of God's people were in bondage in Egypt and they were slaving away for Pharaoh and they're under hard the taskmasters and everything. <laughs> and uh, everything they do is for Pharaoh's glory. Everything they do is for Pharaoh's pyramids and treasure cities. And they cry out to Jehovah, oh, Jehovah, deliver us, deliver us. And so, you know, the story, Jehovah sends Moses. Moses, um, uh, the, the Lord through Moses does a number of plagues, the tenth one being death on the firstborn. If you are in a house uh, and you put blood on your doorpost, guess what happens when the death angel comes through? He'll pass over you. He'll pass over you. So that's where we get the word Passover. So if you believed Moses' word and you put blood on your doorpost, you got, you got redeemed. And then you got to go inside the house and do what with that lamb? Eat the lamb. So that right there is a wonderful picture of Christ as our redeemer, the one that saves us from judgment, and as our strength to get out of the world. You know, Egypt typifies the world. Okay, praise the Lord. Then they got up to the river, you know, the Red Sea there, and what happened? You know, they're stuck, and Moses, I mean, uh, Pharaoh's chariots are coming after them, and, and the Lord opens the sea. And, this, and they cross through the sea, and in 1 Corinthians 10, um, he says this was a baptism. They were baptized there by, in, by Moses, or under Moses, in the cloud and in the sea. So, okay, they're out, out away from the bondage. They've been saved. Have you all been saved? Have you crossed the river? Have you been baptized? And then, you know, there was a, they came to a place that had bitter water. And they, you know, the Lord told Moses to throw a stick in there or a tree in there and signifying the cross, and it would become sweet. They enjoyed sweet water. Then there was a daily, you know, daily they had their, um, their daily bread provided as manna. Isn't that good? And then what? A water that came out of a rock, you know? <laughs> you struck the rock, and water comes pouring out of there. I mean, all the needs are met, and uh, they're saved. Okay, you know, I, I would be really happy right there. Stop right there. But right in, at, at this point, listen to this verse. In Exodus 25, 8, Jehovah says, let them make a, now, let them make a sanctuary for me. Okay, just think about it. All these things that have happened to them up to then, they think, oh, Jehovah's saving me. Oh, he's re releasing me. He's getting rid of all the enemies for me. He's turning my water, you know, making my water sweet for me. He's giving me daily bread for who? Me. He's giving me water out of the rock for who? Me. And then all of a sudden, let them build a sanctuary for me. Big change right here. This isn't all for you. <laughs> this isn't all for you, children of Israel. This is for me. Jehovah, I want something. I want you to build me a sanctuary. And you know what was really something there is they built this tent and, you know, the big tabernacle and it had all kinds of components, outer court, you know, inner court, holy of holies. God, he dwelled in that holy of holies. It was only 10 
by 10 by 10 cubits, and a cubit's about a foot and a half. So you're talking 15 feet by 15 feet, which I don't know, you know, maybe that's as big as this podium. Um, 225 square feet house <laughs> God's living in. Can you imagine the infinite almighty God limits himself to a little tiny, you know, cube, 15, 10 by 10 by 10 cubits for what? Why? What does he want? He wants to dwell with man. He wants to dwell on the earth with his people. And, you know, if you look at the picture of what, how he had them set up in, in the camp and array, he had all the tribes camping. This is two million people, just imagine. And they're in 12 tribes, and they're, and they're arrayed all around. God's tent is in the middle. And they're all, all their little tent flaps or, or tent doors face God's house. Isn't that a beautiful scene? This is what he wants. He wants to dwell with man. He wants to dwell on the earth with man. And then later, again, this is a portrait in the Old Testament. We come to the temple, and God's house got enlarged. He got enlarged, I think, double, right? So now it's 20 by 20 by 20 cubits. So just imagine this podium going out now, you know, to, uh, I guess, 30 by 30 feet or something. God's house got enlarged. Okay. Again, that's all picture. Then when, um, you know, when uh, Jesus comes, we all know that verse, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He revealed himself that he was the tabernacle of God. God was dwelling on the earth in that little man. Similar to the little Holy of Holies in the Old Testament, now he's in a little man, Jesus, and he's dwelling on the earth. And just as he was in the, the tabernacle there, he's somewhat hidden. You, know, you couldn't really see him in there uh, from outside. In the same way, nobody knew that God was dwelling on the earth in Jesus, at least at the beginning, right? Um, he, did, he did show himself. He unzipped his glory to some, but... For the most part, he was hidden there. But did he want to stay in that little, tiny, just one man? No. So his goal was to be enlarged, that his house would be enlarged, his dwelling place would be enlarged. And this is what happened through this process. He redeemed us, he regenerated us, and now he's come to indwell us. And how big is his house today? <laughs> Much bigger. M millions. There's millions of believers that have Christ living in them. Isn't that something? You know, eventually in the New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem is 144,000 stadia by 144,000 stadia by 144,000 stadia, which is like 3,000 miles squared. So just imagine the enlargement. <laughs> so God's dwelling place is being enlarged. Okay, so the first thing under uh, dwelling place is um, that it is for God's rest. And, you know, here in Psalm 132, 13 through 14, let's have the brothers read that. You ready, brothers? Go. Yes, so this is where the Lord was, uh, uh, David, excuse me, was bringing the ark back to Jerusalem to join it to the tabernacle. The ark had been over there in kiriath Jerum, I believe, and the t tabernacle was in Jerusalem. And so David was bringing the ark back. So the ark in, in typology signifies Christ, and the tabernacle in this typology signifies the church. So he's bringing Christ into the church. And here he says, this is my rest forever. This is my rest forever. And you know, there's another place where God mentions his rest, and that is in um, Isaiah 66, 1. You know, he kind of opened up his heart there, and he said, Therefore, says Jehovah, heaven is my throne, and the earth is the footstool for my feet. Where then is the house that you will build for me, and where is the place of my rest? Isn't it something that God wants, a, wants rest? You know, you know uh, like, I ride my bicycle sometimes to work, and when I ride to work, it takes me like 25 minutes. And when I ride home, it takes 15 minutes. So you know why I figured out the difference is? When I'm coming home, I'm, I'm coming home. <laughs> when I go into work, I'm not in a real hurry to get to work. Who wants to go to work? I want to go home. Because why? Home is where I rest. <laughs> you know, when you get, get to your home, you can just you can let your hair down and you can rest. God, he's not tired. You know, there's a verse that says uh, God doesn't get tired. He didn't rest because he was tired. Isaiah 40, 28 says, Jehovah doesn't get weary. 
doesn't faint. Um, <laughs> so anyway, he rests because he's satisfied. He's satisfied with the condition and situation. So it's in the church that God has rest. That's why we have rest in the church. We have rest in the church. So sometimes, you know, brothers and sisters, when we don't have rest, you know, we have to wonder, maybe God's not at rest. You know, if, if, when, if God is at rest, we'll be at rest. But sometimes we're not at rest, and that's because God's not, something's not right. We're not happy. And, you know, there was one time way back when I was y'all's age, um, I had come into the church, and I had found the rest. I was enjoying the unsearchable riches of Christ. I was in the heavens. But I thought I wanted something in the world. And I pursued that, and it got me right out of the enjoyment of the riches of Christ and right out practically of the church. I wasn't in the meeting of the church. And although I got my heart's desire um, in, in that way, I was miserable. You know why? No rest. I lay on my bed at night, no rest. And you know why? Because God's not happy. He's not at rest. And then I repented. <laughs> I said, Lord, amen, whatever the price I have to pay, I want to go back to that place where there's rest. And I did pay the price, and I came back to the fellowship. Boom, rest. I'm I am at rest because God inside of me is at rest. So the church is where God has rest. And then let's go on here to the next point. He, uh, or excuse me, next verse. We'll have the uh, sisters read this, Ephesians 3, 16 through 17a. You ready, sisters? Go. Yeah, so this is really related to expression. You know, if you go into a house and you see a bunch of books on a big shelf, what do you think about these people? What do you know about them? You hadn't even met them yet. What do you know about them? They like to read. Or you go in there and there's toys all over the floor. It's like, these people have children here. There's children here, right? So when you come to the church, what should you see? What do you think you see? Christ. You look over here on this wall, what do you see? You look over there in that room, what do you see? <laughs> Christ, Christ, Christ. If you come to the church, this is what you'll see, Christ. The church, is, uh, the church expresses Christ. And, um, you know, really, a lot of times we don't express Christ. Let's just be honest. So we need, as Paul prayed in this prayer, for the Lord to strengthen us with power through his spirit into the inner man, that's our spirit, that Christ could make his home in our heart. And just like sometimes you might let somebody into the foyer of your house, you know, and, and, and then you say, <laughs> stop right there, especially like a salesman. Please wait right here uh, <laughs> or whatever. Eventually, you know, with the Lord, he comes into our spirit, and then we say, hey, Lord, that's good. Thank you. Stay right there. I'll be back in a day or so. Uh, but eventually, because we love him and he woos and wins us, eventually we are like, well, Lord, why don't you come on in here to the living room? <laughs> and uh, in, in, in other words, we may let him into other areas of our life. Like, Lord, yes, Lord, you can come into my driving. Amen. Or how about my career? Or, Lord, how about my future spouse that I don't even know who it is yet? Amen. <laughs> so how, how deep you want to let him in, we need to be strengthened into the inner man. And the more you let him in and the more he comes and makes his home, the more the church expresses him. And then point B, you have the household of God, which is his family. This is a very precious point. Um, you know, and let's have the brothers read Ephesians 2.19. You ready? Ready, brothers? Go. Yeah, and then um, we'll go ahead and read the, I mean, that's the real key point there is we are not only the house, but we're the household. This means we're his family. Did you know God is a family man? He has a big family, and we are in his family. It's so good to have him as our father. Oh, <laughs> and my father died when I was kind of young, and it's good, been good to have God as my father. Oh, Father, I need you. Thank you, Father. Yeah, and then uh, let's go on to the next one. Sisters, John 1, 1, 12 through 13. Ready, sisters, go. Amen. So how do 
how do you get into this family how do you get into any family <laughs> you get born you're born into the family yeah so we were born again we were born of the spirit we were regenerated to be children of god and then let's have the brothers on first uh, john two thirteen. ready brothers go Yeah, so again, with this point, you see there's three, um, there's, in this family, there's different stages. Some are at the children's stage, some are at the young men's stage, and some are at the, father, the older saint's stage, right? And actually, I think I've kind of gone through at least two and a half, <laughs> maybe three stages, and it's really precious. You know, it's good to be a young one in God's house. You know, you get all the benefit of your, your older brothers and sisters, and even the the ancient, <laughs> the, the, the fathers and the mothers in the church life. And, you know, if you get on the heart of these mothers, you will make progress. You know, there's such a heritage to us to have these older brothers and sisters that, you know, if we get into their heart and they begin to pray for us, we will make progress. And also, they are a great reservoir of, of rich help. You know, I'm a kind of person, I've not made as fast as spiritual progress as I could have because I don't usually ask for help. I just try to, you know, make it on my own. I'm too proud or have been too proud to ask for help. But I've seen other brothers, they ask for help all the time. Just real quick. They have a problem, ask for help. I have a problem, I try to, you know, waste a couple months just floundering around on my own. This brother, he asks for help, he gets help. I'm like, why didn't I take that way? I should have asked for help a long time ago. <laughs> so ask for help. <laughs> ask for fellowship. And you'll get a lot of riches from these older saints. And, you know, the, the, the older ones, they really benefit from the younger ones. The, the younger ones make the older ones vital. You know, there was a period of time when I was not doing that great. I mean, I wasn't out of the church or anything, but I was just kind of, you know, in a mire or whatever. And, um, and then I think the brothers started bringing the college age over to my house. Uh, for the home meeting, I mean, for the college age meeting. This was a few years back. And um, <laughs> at first, I'd even go upstairs during the meeting. I'd just disappear. Yeah, you can use my house, but I'm going to be upstairs. <laughs> but after a few weeks, you know, those young people began to get in my heart. I'd hear them, even though I was upstairs hiding in my room, I'd hear the singing coming upstairs. You know, drink a river pure and clear. You know what happened? I got vitalized, <laughs> I got revived because of the younger ones so you younger ones y'all really matter in the family okay let's go on to the body of christ the church is the body of christ uh, ephesians 1 22 through 23 says and he subjected all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body first corinthians 12 27 says now you are the body of christ and members individually so the church, this is not a metaphor. The church is the body of Christ, the enlargement of Christ. He, he's the head, and we're the body. We're a corporate entity. Isn't that something? Um, and let's, let's look at the first point here. Are you ready, brothers? Let's read point A, and then the verses. Ready, go. Amen. into all all things who is the head christ out from whom all the body being joined together and being knit together through every joint of the rich supply and through the operation in the measure of each one part causes the growth of the body yeah so this point is really um, precious in that our relationship, we need to realize that Christ is our head. You know, sometimes I've heard people pray, Lord, be our head. No, no, no. You don't need to pray that he be your head. He is your head. <laughs> Lord, you are my head. How about we pray that? Lord, you are my head. You don't need to pray for him to be your head. Just say, Lord, you are my head. Lord, anyway, that, that's really something. He is our head. Christ is the head of every man, and he is the head of the body. 
So we need to take him and even to grow up into him in all things. And our relationship with the head affects our relationship with the body. In other words, if you're right with the head, you'll probably be all right with the body. So, um, you know, if you are, like Neil was saying, running red lights all day, you're not listening to the head, you're not open to the head, and <laughs> just living your own life, okay, how do you feel when you see the brothers and sisters, the other members of the body? Yeah, <laughs> you hide upstairs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, I, when I used to be on campus, and if I was in my flesh or, you know, I'd committed some kind of sin or something like that, and I saw the brothers coming, you know, up the sidewalk or something like that, I would just make a real quick turn and walk the other direction. Because I, I, I had a problem with the head. I didn't, actually, those brothers didn't know anything. But there was a problem between me. I wasn't taking Christ as my head. And so as a result, I, you can tell. There's a verse, actually, that says, we know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brothers so if you're not loving the brothers what does that mean yeah you're you're dead <laughs> sometimes we may not realize we're dead but then you see the brothers and are you oh praise the lord brothers or are you like you know <laughs> so that shows that shows whether the the bodies attest to us whether we're been holding the head okay then let's read the point b sisters you ready uh let's read the, the point and then we'll read colossians 3 10 through 11 you ready go Christ is all and in all. And I'd really like to point out here that the church is an organism filled with the life of Christ. And um, if, if you look at John 15, chapter, I believe it's verse 5, he says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. He talks about abiding in me and I in you. What is a vine with branches? Is that an organization? That's an organism. And the organism, you know, the most important thing for, the, for an organism is it needs to be filled with life. And this, of course, is the divine life, not just the you know, human life. This is the divine life. So if you see this, um, you realize, oh, the church is an organism, and it needs to be filled with life. Okay, I'm coming to the meeting. What should I do? do should I just come in my natural man with my natural life? The church is an organism filled with the life of Christ. I need to bring the life of Christ. I better turn. I better turn on the way to the meeting. Oh, Lord Jesus. Lord, forgive me. Cleanse me. Fill me. I want to bring you to the meeting. So this vision, listen, the vision we're talking about, about the vision of uh, the church, the produce of the riches of Christ, the church, it affects us. It affects like our whole consciousness even as we're coming to the meetings. I'm coming to this meeting for what? I'm coming to this meeting for the church. And what is the church? The church is the body of Christ. And what does the body of Christ need? It needs life. So what should I do? Exercise my spirit. Oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Use those six ropes. Call upon his name, etc. Until, until the water starts flowing. And then, listen, you, you will bring life to the, to the meeting. Okay, let's look at the last one here. So we have the head, we have life, and now we have what? Functioning. A living entity with every member functioning in life. So in the body, we have the matter of functioning. So if you see the body, you'll realize I am a member. And what do members do? They function. Okay, so let's read all together. We'll read Ephesians 4, 7. You ready? Go. Okay, let's have the sisters read the next one. Go, sisters. Okay, so when we realize that we're members of the body, we realize, oh, we need to function. I need to function. I have a function. What is it? Don't get in your mind about what it is. Just realize if you receive grace, you will function. Okay? And um, so the main thing is just to get filled with grace, and the function comes out. And here in 1 Corinthians 12, 
Paul was kind of helping those that thought they were less than a member. So this is those of us that think, oh, I'm so small. My function doesn't matter. Or because I'm not, I can't speak like this brother, you know, I might as well just not say anything. I can't speak like all those people that go up to the microphone. (laughs) Right? Uh, So, no, that's not right. Uh, Just because you think, or even you say it, you might even say it, I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. It is not because of this, not of the body. You are still a member of the body. And, you know, I've um, I've had, uh, well, maybe let's go on to the next point. I'll share on the next point, my little story. Okay, let's read, um, who do we have on that one? Sisters, brothers, on 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 22. You ready, brothers, go. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again... But much rather the members of the body which seem to be weaker. Are yeah, so this is um, really something that, the, <laughs> you know, some of us have the problem of thinking too low of ourselves, and the other, some of us might have a problem of thinking too highly of ourselves. And, you know, I'm a whatever, I, I, I have no need of you. But that is a big mistake. And, and Paul asks us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. And it turns out that these members that seem to be weaker actually are very, very necessary. And, you know, there was one sister that we were close to, and she she was a young sister, and she just was not according to my concept of how you should function. You know, she didn't function as I thought she, uh, you know, anybody should function. Very different, different person. And, you know, inwardly, didn't say anything to anybody, but inwardly there's just, you know, a little bit of this uh, whatever, (laughs) you know, look probably thinking more highly of myself than I ought to think and then one day I was really down in the dumps and she asked me how I was doing and I said well you know blah 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 and I poured out my down in the dumps you know (laughs) story to her and she was like oh Mike don't worry you're okay you know blah 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 and she just she just really encouraged me and she empathized with me and comforted me and when I left there I was like I was feeling completely different I was all encouraged and, uh, and I'm like, what just happened? And I realized that sister just functioned. She just functioned, and I got the benefit. That wasn't the function I thought sh- she should do, but it, I was really appreciative when she functioned. I got the function, and it was so important to the body. And I d- was wondering if she even realized that she did that in the body. But anyway, um, I really appreciated her. Another thing was, another time I was kind of, you know, in, you know not doing so well, uh, my, ro- my road has been kind of like this, but anyway. <laughs> and uh, guess who came to visit me when I was um, kind of, you know, I don't know, dormant or down in the dumps or whatever? It wasn't the brothers that I typically think of as being so active and spiritual and maybe on the front row. <laughs> Nothing wrong with you front row brothers, but it was the brothers that were on the back row. And the brothers that weren't paying too much attention and the brothers that didn't seem to exercise that much, they came, two, three, maybe even four of them, to visit me, spend time with me. And that amazed me. Not right then, but later I was like, that was the Lord coming to me through these members that before I did not appreciate so highly. Now I appreciate them. I really appreciate them now. They were my lifeline. They were my lifeline. So anyway, this matter of the body is really something. I need to go on to the fullness here. Let's go on to point four. So this is, fullness is actually related to the body, the fullness of the one who fills all in all, because that verse said, um, let's go back, where is that verse? Is it under here? Oh yeah, okay, we're going to read the verse right now. Ephesians 1, 22 through 23. Sisters, how about we read these two verses? You ready? Go. right and then brothers let's see we see the unsearchable riches of christ in the next verse let's read ephesians 3 8 ready brothers go yeah so this matter of the fullness what is the fullness so first we have the riches and we've been talking about those and actually there's over if you go through your new testament 
sometime, you should go through and just highlight all the aspects of Christ as you go through. There's like over 400 <laughs> riches or aspects of Christ in the New Testament. Um, so we just got started on Friday night with James' sharing. We just touched the surface. Uh, so many riches. And then as these riches come into us, as we enjoy these riches, you know, on God's side, he's dispensing. He's dispensing. On our side, we're experiencing and enjoying. So as we're experiencing and enjoying these riches, what happens is we, get, we start getting filled. And I, was, I, I didn't get as prepared as the other brothers with a demo and all that, but let's just imagine, okay? Just imagine there's an a opaque vase up here. Well, you can imagine, let's just say it's green. You've got a green vase, and I start dumping um, candy into it, nuts, you know, treats. All right, I'm putting them in one after another, maybe bag after bag. Okay, what's going to happen? It's going to get full, right? And it's going to fill. So here it is. Just imagine you've got this, the base, and the candy's coming in. Candy's coming in. And I get a couple of brothers to help me, and we get buckets, five-gallon buckets, and we start dumping candy in there. What's going to happen? It's going to overflow. And when it hits that top and candy starts pouring out, that is the fullness. That is the fullness. That's the expression of the riches that are being deposited into that vase pouring out. In other words, the vase can't hold it anymore. It's overflowming. It's expressing. You know, they're come, the, the riches are coming out. So this is, the, when I, when I, usually we use the glass of water example, but when I heard this one about candy, it hit me for some reason. <laughs> Maybe because I like candy. But this is the picture of the church as the fullness of the one who fills all in all. And you know, when uh, in John 1.18, it says, of his fullness, we all received grace upon grace. So when Jesus came as the embodiment of the triune God, as a man, it says, of his fullness, he was full. He was full of God. He was so full that God was just coming out. God was coming out in all of his, uh, you know, his virtues. God was coming out in his words. God was coming out in the things he did, the compassion he had. I mean, just on and on. As you read the Gospels, you just see the fullness of God in a man. And now this man is what? gone through the process to become the spirit he's dispensing into us now we as the church are what we are the body of christ his fullness the fullness of the one who fills all in all but we have to be honest a lot of times we're not that full <laughs> right so if you see this that the church is supposed to be the fullness of the one who fills in all the fullness of the one who fills all in all what should we do we better eat more riches yeah we better more enjoy more of the riches of christ isn't that something lord we want to eat the riches so we can become your fullness when you're full you know my wife can tell when i'm full of christ because i come home and i just don't stop talking you know normally i come home and i don't say that much but um but when i'm full of christ i'm just like following around the house blah, 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 and i'm talking 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 about the meeting about the brothers, about what happened to so and so. Da 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 da. I'm I'm overflowing. I can't stop. You know, wonderful things happen when we get that full. We start expressing God almost unconsciously to other people. You know, one time I was in a home meeting, and and of course I was just in the kind of a regular church life, so I was getting filled all the time. But this particular home meeting was especially sweet and especially filling, and I really enjoyed the Lord. And as, I, as we wrapped up and we were finishing, I kept thinking about this guy. And he was from my, um, I guess maybe I enjoyed loving man. <laughs> the lover of man started coming up in me. And I, and I even had to go to the old phone book. This is way back when, when we had phone books. And look him up. I hadn't seen him in years. I hadn't seen him in years. Just had a feeling. Call him. I called him. And sure enough, he had had a big crisis in his life and had just turned to the Lord just turned to the lord and he was wide open so you know we began to get together and enjoy the riches of christ together and it really met his need also of course met my need and he's still in the church to this day praise the lord but that i would realize that came out of the fullness i wasn't sitting there you know with some kind of plan trying to figure out how to gain this guy or whatever i just got filled and spontaneously the loving of man flowed out and I contact, normally I wouldn't contact somebody like that, but because I was filled, I did. Okay, that's just an example. Lord, fill us. All right, then we go on to the new man. 
All right. Um, let's uh, let's read Ephesians two fourteen through sixteen. That's a lot of verses. Uh, how about we alternate brothers and then sisters and then brothers again? You ready, brothers? Fourteen. Ephesians two fourteen. Go. And sisters on 15, abolishing in his flesh all of the commandments and ordinances, that he might create the two in himself into one new man, so making peace through the blood of his cross. Brothers, both in one body to God through the cross, having slain the enmity by it. And then these are those verses below that. Again, we read them earlier, um, the ones that end up talking about the new man who's being renewed uh, according to the image of him cr who created him, uh, where Christ is all and in all. There's not all these different races, but Christ is all and in all. And, you know, here he says he made both one. So that's referring to the Jews and the Gentiles. So at that time, you know, the Lord firstly, when he baptized um, the, the disciples at the day of Pentecost, he baptized the Jews only. But then in Acts chapter 10, you had uh, at Cornelius' house, there was this different group of people. They were green, <laughs> Gentiles. And now the Lord, as the Holy Spirit, he got into these Gentiles. And they got baptized, and they also got baptized in the Holy Spirit there. So the Spirit came upon them. So now it seems like you've got two different groups. I mean, these people have, they have a bunch of ordinances that separate them. In fact, it was almost like there was a middle wall there dividing these two groups of people. And that was their, um, mainly, the, the law of commandments and ordinances were mainly related to circumcision, keeping the Sabbath, and the dietary regulations. These things just, if you were a Jew, you're like, Oh, those guys, they are so uncivilized. They are Gentile dogs. They don't even wash their hands before they eat, you know, and so forth. And then these guys are over here, you know, the Gentiles looking at the Jew, Jewish believers. Now, these are all believers. Yet even in the body, there was kind of like, you know, this division, and, or could be, and I believe there was to some extent. And Paul was, of course, trying to bring them together, and that's why he's telling them, well, anyway, these guys are saying to these, <laughs> saying, oh, you guys are... Y'all really think something, y'all are something, right? Anyway, so there's just this division. These hate those, these hate these. And, but the Lord on the cross, he not only, you know, on the cross, he did so many wonderful things. Took away sin, sins, the world, the old man, the devil. He terminated everything. Well, one item he also terminated was the law of the commandments and ordinances. He tore down the middle wall of partition that he might make both one. <laughs> so this is the both might make both one so there's no more division no more enmity now you look at the christians today on the earth is the are the christians today on the earth one <laughs> and a lot of it's due to our culture our ways of living our ordinances all kinds of different things and listen all of that stuff is in the old man but paul paul says that old man was crucified you need to put off the old man and you need to put on the new man the new man is Christ. And I don't have time to read them right now, but there's some great verses in Colossians 3 where you can contrast the old man and the new man. And I guarantee you, after reading those verses from Colossians uh, 3, 5 through 17, you just, you'll want to be in the new man. In the new man, there's oneness, there's care for one another, there's love, there's forbearance, there's forgiveness. And in the old man, there's all this horrible stuff. Uh, so saints, put off the old man and put on the new man. How do we do that? Well, the death of Christ is in the Spirit. So when you, put, when, you, when you say, Lord Jesus, I love you, and you get into your Spirit, that middle wall in you, it goes down. So whenever you feel something cropping up between you and some other brothers or you and some other sisters, turn to the Lord. Apply the cross and enjoy the Spirit, and that middle wall will come down. Okay, um, and this is really crucial because the new man is for the dominion to subdue God's enemy, recover the earth, and exercise God's authority over the earth. He needs the new man. He needs the new man. Okay, now finally I want to come to the bride of Christ. The last point, 
Praise the Lord for the bride of Christ. How about everybody say, we're the bride of Christ? And, um, okay, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. How about we have the sisters read these verses? Ready? Go, sisters. Brothers, let's go ahead and just finish up the verses here. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. Go. Oh, so sweet. Christ loved the church. He gave himself up for her. He loves, that means he loves us. He gave himself up for us. So the church, is, as the bride of Christ, it's a matter of love. There's three little points I wanted to mention. One is that the church is only that which is out of Christ. So just like Eve, the first bride, was uh, built out of Adam's rib, the church is produced out of Christ. And, you know, you can see here, where does the church come from? It comes from the dispensing of the unsearchable or the riches of Christ as the Spirit, into people, this is the church. So the church is Christ. <laughs> Christ, who's come through, it's God coming through a process in Christ and coming to, into us. So we, as the church, are Mrs. Christ. <laughs> we match him. Just like Eve matched Adam, we match Christ. Now, do we fully match Christ yet? No. So we have to go through this process of being sanctified. You know, he gave himself up for us in the past. He's sanctifying and cleansing us by the washing of the water in the word now. And in the future, what's he going to do? Verse 27, present the church to himself glorious. So brothers and sisters, we need to be getting prepared. Let's get prepared for our wedding. Y'all, y'all see that in uh, Revelation 19.6? It says, uh, you know, let us rejoice and exult and let us give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. She has made herself ready. So what are we doing today? We're getting ourselves ready. So let's get prepared. And listen, the way we get prepared is by being beautified. And we're beautified by the indwelling Christ. As we look at him and enjoy him, he shines into us. And you know what happens when he shines into us? We start shining out to others. This is the real beautification is we shine out with all of uh, his riches coming from, from enjoying him. So, that's the, so he's making us beautiful by us looking and enjoying him. So I wanted to flip the board over real quick. I got like three minutes left. So um, here's the, uh, and probably saw you in the back, might not be able to read it, but basically on the left we have the house, the body, the fullness, the new man and the bride, the five points we covered in this message. And then we have the different things that God gets here. Uh, God's need is being met. So again, this message was, on one hand, it was for us, but it was also, we're talking about God's need being filled. He gets rest and a family in his house. He gets an organism with function in the body. He gets expression and flowing out when in the, with the fullness. He gets dominion and his, his move on the earth through the new man, and he gets his uh, satisfaction. He's satisfied with the bride, and she's his counterpart. So I just put a couple prayers we can pray over here related to all these um, items, okay? So one good way to cooperate with the Lord according to his eternal purpose is to pray. Ask. <laughs> A-S-K, right? Ask. Okay, so let's pray. Let's, let's say these together for the house. And I know, again, some of y'all won't be able to see them probably. But anyway, for the house, you ready? Let's say this one together. Lord, strengthen me. Okay, another one. Make home in my heart. All right, how about for the body? Here's a, here's a prayer. Lord, you're my head. Amen. How about this one? Fill me with life. And then for the fullness. Fill me. Overflow from me. And the new man. Renew me. Sorry. Move through us. And then the bride. Lord Jesus, I love you. How about 
beautify me. Anyway, I think that's it for my time. Uh, so, brothers and sisters, I hope we see that um, all these unsearchable riches of Christ that have now been made available to us through the Spirit, they have a produce. God is going to get something in us. So may this vision, um, you know, penetrate and, uh, and even govern us for our whole life. Amen.